Good afternoon. My name's Simon Longstaff, Executive Director of the Ethics Centre, and I'd like to welcome you to the Bear Pit, an opportunity to see behind the scenes in this chamber, the Legislative Assembly of the New South Wales Parliament, which is so famed for the aggressive confrontations it brings to bear. But on this occasion, it's a place for conversation and an opportunity to see what goes on in the minds of politicians, former politicians in the media, around the question of changing our mind. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the presiding officers of the New South Wales Parliament, the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, the Honourable Jonathan O'Day, and the President of the Legislative Council, the Honourable Matthew Mason Cox. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose lands we meet today. I have my own kinship ties with the people from the Andandaliaqua community on Groot Island. And I recognise the importance of acknowledging the stewardship of those persons who have looked after this land on all of our behalves since before the time of recorded history. So I hope that everyone will join with me in acknowledging the Gadigal from the Eora Nation here today. I'm joined with a distinguished panel. Sitting on my left, the Honourable Victor Dominello MP. He's the member for RIDE, the Minister for Customer Service and the Minister for Digital. Ms Antoinette Latouf, Director of Media Diversity Australia, a practising Network 10 journalist. Mr David Shoebridge, a member of the Legislative Council in the New South Wales Parliament. The Honourable Ms Carmel Tebbett, who is the CEO of the New South Wales Mental Health Coordinating Council and a former Deputy Premier of New South Wales representing the Labor Party. And John Brogdon, who is also a former, New South, in this case, a New South Wales opposition leader on behalf of the Liberal Party and currently serves as CEO of Landcom. Now, would you please join me in welcoming them all? I should also mention that, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, Ms Daniel Wood, who's CEO of the Grattan Institute, has been able, unable to join us from Melbourne. Well, the conversation today is about changing the mind, and it's not just about how we might change our minds in, in politics, but also in life in general. And I should say that later on in our conversation, I'll be providing an opportunity for the audience who's watching us online or in the room to actually ask questions, perhaps in response to the things we've been saying. Antoinette Latouf, I'm wondering if I could begin with you. Have you recently changed your mind on any topics? And if so, what have they been about? Yeah, there's actually two instances where I've changed my mind. And interestingly, one's quite topical, and that is on refugee policy. And so for a long time, I've thought that offshore processing and offshore detention is quite inhumane, um, and it goes against our international human rights obligations. And while I still believe it's not the right uh, policy, What's shifted is I went for dinner with um, actually a neighbour of mine and a relative of this neighbour, neighbour, and now one serves in the Navy and another in the Army. And both were part of sort of frontline response when um, intervening and intercepting boats. And they spoke of how harrowing it was, literally scooping babies out of the water and the enormous mental health impacts um, that it's had on them. And also what they witnessed in terms of people smugglers. And, you know, so they would sink the boat when they saw a Navy ship mm. within eyesight. Um, and so I, I guess in, in politics, there was a lot of demonisation of people smugglers. And sometimes, I guess, in that circumstance at the time, I thought, well, it's easy to focus on the big bad wolf. But what about Paul Little Red Riding Hood? That's who's really vulnerable. Um, and I guess for me, hearing from people we don't ordinarily hear from and getting their first person accounts in no political arena, having no real, like, they don't have any real influence. It was dinner table conversation, made me stop and think, OK, well, I don't think we have the right balance. This is a perspective I haven't considered before. And there is something, there is, you know, something quite exploitative about the people smuggler train, um, the chain. Um, and yeah, I'm just not sure what the answer is, but I'm not as fixed in my opposition as I once was. Um, and I'd love to see some leadership from Labor in terms of offering something that's, a cl that's clearly different or offering some sort of solution. I'm not an expert um, in this area, but I, I, was really, I was really surprised by 
hearing from people personally affected who were, were you not surprised interested by yourself did you? I, I was surprised by my response yeah. i was surprised because i was so staunchly like these kind of people smugglers were kind of these fictional characters that were used as political weapons in my in, in, in from my perspective um, and then hearing from mm. these individuals one actually from the british navy and one from the australian army um, really made me question. Um, okay, question you had a second one, but I want to come back to that because yes. I'm just getting everybody to have a chance to talk about. It doesn't have to be about politics. I'm just talking about in life in general. Victor? Uh, it was, yesterday was the Queen's holiday, long weekend. Uh, I remember as a kid, I used to be an avid Republican. You know, with Italian heritage, I would always think, why isn't there an Italian flag in the corner of our flag? For good reason, obviously, now. But uh, I, I think uh, as I've... Um, read more widely and understood more about the dynamics of, uh, of the world. There was one book in particular that really changed my mind, and it was uh, a book called Why Nations Fail. And I thought, actually, th there are some institutional structures around the world that we need. Um, and, yeah, I think that shifted my view. So, so you are less of a Republican now than you were? Yeah, like before it was Republican at all costs. I don't care. Just, uh, you know, there's no right for the, the, you know, the, the, the Union Jack to be in our corner. It's got nothing to do with Australia. But now, now I've moved to a point is um, this is a stable institution and it needs a very compelling argument to move away from it. Right. Carmel? Um, mine's a bit closer to, well, my workplace, I guess. Um, Prior to COVID, we had an arrangement where people could work from home, but it was observed uh, less in the breach than in reality. Uh, and I really was not convinced that working from home was something that a uh, workplace like mine, the Mental Health Coordinating Council, where we need to work together, we do a lot of creative collaborative stuff. I just didn't believe it could genuinely work. During COVID, we had not much choice. Post-COVID, my staff were very keen to continue a more flexible arrangement where everyone had the opportunity to work from home at least part of their week. I was very um, reluctant, I must say, about this approach, but we agreed that we would trial it for three months and see how it went. And I have to say, it's worked. Mm. I don't myself prefer mm. working from home. I prefer to work in an office largely. But I have found that you can make it work. I mean, I think the COVID experience meant we had to embrace it, use technology differently, which prior to COVID we probably weren't doing as an office. But I've changed my mind and I can so Have you? Have you actually changed your mind or have you just acquiesced to the... No, no, I have changed my mind because <laughs> after the three-month trial, we definitely had the opportunity to go back to either a fully office-based environment or perhaps less working from home, but we're stuck with the, we do a 60-40, so 40% working from home, 60% working in the office. Um, and I have changed my mind because I have seen that it can work and that we can get all the benefits of being an office-based organisation, the collaboration, the ability to work together and to create things together, but people can still have that flexibility and work from home using technology effectively. David? Well, I, I won't go at length about the campaign my youngest daughter has had to get a third cat. I, she <laughs> has been successful in that. She's changed my mind. She still doesn't have the numbers in the family. But, um, um, but I suppose maybe just building on what Carmel said, going into COVID, um, well, I have part of a political movement that believes in grassroots democracy and, and bringing people together and trying to come up with consensus decisions. And we have large statewide meetings where we come across from around the state come together as a group. Physically, you used to do that, I guess. Physically, come together once every two months. And um, and there's a kind of, you know, it's a large meeting, sometimes 60 to 80 people, sometimes a few more, where you come together and you try and draw consensus from that large meeting. And uh, um, there was a, with COVID, the, we obviously had to go and turn it from a, in real life to a Zoom meeting. And that had a whole lot of opportunities for regional groups to engage more than they had because often um, um, the dynamic in the party is we have one meeting in Sydney and then one meeting in regional New South Wales. And the ability to come on by Zoom really benefits regional people to come to New South Wales. And um, the, the, we've seen a whole lot of richness in that debate, like voices we wouldn't otherwise hear, but we've also lost, it's a different dynamic when you come together online than when you come together in real life. And, I think we're going through the challenge now of working out 
um, uh, what is the benefit of bringing everyone together, which is obvious and real, and what do you lose uh, online, and what do you lose by not being in the same place at the same time? I've gone from being a person who believed that there was a kind of um, uh, absolute benefit in bringing people together in the same space, to now realising that, in fact, it's not so black and white, mm. that actually a mixture of the two is the best way to have the party engage. And, and I, I've seen the party have this discussion and we've bounced it around in the party and I think we're all coming to that, well, a broad consensus that actually a mixture of the two and it's kind of been interesting watching that no one's really won a debate, but we've actually learned from the last 18 months and hopefully sort of all recognise the merits of the other's viewpoint. Let's go to Bron John, but I'm just going to put you on notice. One thing I want to test a little bit is whether or not we're talking about changes as a result of pragmatic assessments of what works, as opposed to changes of fundamental beliefs. But I, I, mm. And I'm not sure yeah. with yours, because yours seems to be a bit of both. But just get John first, just to get you into the conversation. Um, any major changes you can think of? Yes. Um, in the coming up to 16 years since I left this place, I've been very involved in mental health and suicide prevention, like Carmel. And for the last uh, nine years, I've been the chairman of Lifeline Australia. If you'd asked me five years ago if our calls increasing was a good thing, I would have said, no, it's a disastrous mm. thing. Mm. Uh, from the bushfires, and COVID, our calls went up as high as 30%. Uh, so from 2,500 a day to over 3,300 on some days. Uh, I'm now convinced that's a good thing because it demonstrated people were reaching out to get help when they needed it. And to the extent that there is evidence to support that, and I can only um, confidently use the New South Wales numbers, but despite that increase in calls to Lifeline, in March to December 2020, so if you like the core of the deepest and darkest period of COVID, um, New South Wales experienced a 6% drop in suicide, a story we don't hear enough about, mm. unfortunately. But what it meant is the more calls we got, the lower suicide rate. And I would not have uh, imagined that was the case. So I've now changed my mind and I think more calls is a good thing, not a bad thing. Yeah. So let me go back to that general question I've heard about. We're talking about things I'm not sure about, maybe two, or maybe three, I'm not sure as to whether or not you'd count that view about republicanism as a, a fundamental belief. The issue about refugees and, and the question of um, whether the party needed to meet in person, they could be, I suppose, fundamental beliefs. But and how, how strongly was the belief around you know, republicanism at any cost for you? Was it... I was very strong. Right, okay. Because, so know, this, is a fun, this is a fundamental change. Yeah, because when, when I was a kid, I, you know, I was called a wog, go, go home. I was born in Wright Hospital. What are you talking about? This is my home. You know, so it was really enshrined in me that you know, I, I just wanted Australia to be independent at all costs. But rather than saying I changed my mind, um, I'd like to uh, change it to I opened my mind. Right. Because before I was resolute, there's no ifs or buts. It had to be Republican. Mm. Now my mind is more open because there's more nuances. There's a lot more grey as you get older. You realise there's less black and white, there's more grey. Uh, and, yeah, so I think it's an opening of the mind more than a changing of the mind. The, the, it, is that the same sort of thing with you? Or, look, or, I, or have you actually made some kind of a big shift? No, I th I've made a shift. I don't know what the alternative is. So I wonder when, when you change your mind if you have to then ideologically connect to something else. What I know is that I've shifted away and it was quite uncomfortable. That's why I knew it could really hit at the core where I was like, oh, this is something was I believe. Was it immediate? Did you understand at the time you were sitting in that conversation? No, because I, I spoke about it afterwards with my partner and I've been thinking about it a lot since. And then I just realised also the power of hearing from people and we don't in these situ circumstances from actually hearing from people who are at the front line of our response. Um, and so I'm, I'm still thinking about it now. Um, again, I'm, I'm not an expert on borders and migration and refugee policy, but I'd like to be led and inspired by people who are. Um, so I have shifted, but I'm looking to find a home for, for where I, for my beliefs. What was the second one that you were going to... Oh yeah, my second one was, oh gosh, following, uh, interesting following from the, from Four Corners last night, which looked at losing family members to QAnon. I have myself. And so I'm currently writing a book and in part of my book is about changing hearts and minds, but largely around race and equality. Um, I have some relatives who I used to be very close to, and then during COVID, they got really 
well into conspiracy theories like 5G towers, that the pandemic wasn't real, it was a scamdemic. And then there was a lot of hostility towards me because I'm a journalist, I'm part of the lamestream media. So they started to put a lot of Trump, Trump type talk my way. Um, and so we had a bit of a, well, not a bit, a big beef on social media, which a lot of people do with their, you know, that's silly and I don't know. You know, we're all in lockdown and we're all at home in front of our computers. And then we tried to have dinner together. Actually, I got deleted also by, um, by a couple of cousins who just didn't want to be challenged on their views. We had dinner and then I was beginning to think, you know what, I can still, there's still hope. I can still try and reconcile or still appeal to their better nature. These are good, nice, otherwise intelligent people. But as I write my book, I'm beginning to understand there are different types of people when it comes to change. There are those who are either neutral, indifferent, or in support. They're kind of the movable middle. And there are those in staunch agreement, the, that echo chamber, that mm. bubble we like to surround mm. ourselves with, and those in staunch opposition. They are in staunch opposition. They do not want to change their minds. And so I've decided I'm not going to try and reconcile that but the, that when relationship. You, when you hear uh, Victor Dominello's story then about having been staunchly republic at any cost, you know, out of strong experience, and now his mind has opened up to the possibility that perhaps there's some t stability in the existing situation. Does that encourage you to think about the possibility of people well, I guess progressing? So, no, I, guess it, I guess it comes down to what personal responsibility do I have to change that person's mind? And so, and, and a lot of the, the work I'm doing in my, in my book is about choosing your niche, choosing wh who, where and why you advocate, and choosing your audience. And if your audience really are those you know, tinfoil 5G believing, you know, and I'm part of the enemy because I'm mainstream media, then I'm just not sure my efforts are placed in that direction. In ineffective, inefficient. I think, it's, I think it's just mm. a waste of time and effort. And so it's a sad realisation, but... I was looking for various quotations around changing your mind in the lead up to this, and I got this cracker from George Bernard Shaw. He said, progress is impossible without change, and those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. It seems almost like a little quotation written for people in political life, I guess, because presumably you go into politics because you do want to affect change. David, to, I mean, yeah. are there any fundamental beliefs? I mean, Victor's is quite a fundamental shift, I guess. What about you? Did you always have your political orientation or is this something you've grown into over time? Um, yeah, I, so I wasn't, I wasn't raised in a political family. Uh, my politics sort of awakened... Um, in my sort of mid twenties onwards, really. I mean, I, I, I touched into um, uh, student politics at university. I found it repulsive and stepped away from it. Um, probably a good decision in hindsight. Um, and then engaged in politics again when I started doing a lot of legal work for unions. Uh, started getting engaged with sort of broader social movements. Uh, uh, fundamentally rejected what I saw as a grossly unlawful illegal war in Iraq, and that was. That, that sort of political awakening sort of matched my love of nature and bushwalking and that's what led me into the Greens. Um, um, ultimately what persuaded me was something that happened next door in, in my workplace, the Legislative Council. I saw Lee Rhiannon do this, I thought, quite heroic, brave fight of all things about workers' compensation and I'd gone to see her on behalf of injured workers and said, can you please, you know, oppose what was then a Labor push to remove rights. And I just saw her commit heart and soul to the campaign from a position of principle. And I thought, well, I'd like a bit more of that in my life. And that's what brought me into politics. But um, I do think you need to be able to change your mind in politics. Um, it's hard when you're connected to a party and you need to persuade your party about where you're going. Um, for example, I changed my mind on, on a pretty fundamental issue for me um, over the issue of double jeopardy not allowing someone to be prosecuted twice by the state about a criminal offence. Just explain, what was your initial view and what did it come to be? Well, I came at a, a sort of bleeding heart civil libertarian um, lawyer saying you, you, the, the rule of double jeopardy, which says the state can't criminally prosecute you twice for the same circumstances, is about a fundamental thing about individual freedom. Because otherwise the state can just keep prosecuting you and prosecuting you until they get you convicted. And I thought you can never, ever this would be one of those immutable principles. Um, but I did some campaigning with the families from Bowerville who lost mm -hmm. their three kids to what on the face of it is a serial murder. And um, they'd had two trials that misfired and they wanted to go back and get justice for their kids. 
And it's when I heard their individual stories, when I understood the, the depth of pain, and I was hearing that pain and individual story, and I, I weighed against that a very abstract legal principle, I thought, do you know what? You know, the job of politics is to kind of find a, find a balance between these two. Interesting you say abstract, because it was also foundational. I mean, that's a yeah. complete foundation of British law, double jeopardy. Yeah, abs yeah. Abs absolutely. And I, you know, I don't, I don't junk it out entirely, but I say the, yeah. the, hum the, the criminal justice system, the laws that this place make are obviously imperfect. And if you have these fundamental non-negotiable lines and it's going to destroy people's lives or utterly end the pathways to justice, well, then maybe we should renegotiate the edges of those lines. That was hard for me. Really it hard. sounds to me like there's an echo of Antoinette's oh. story in this about it's something to do with the actual testimony of people who've either been there in the Navy or the Army confronting it or the families who have suffered the loss, that more than any kind of, abs well, call it an abstract, maybe it's not an abstract, any matter of pure principle, is trumped by that. Carmel, the, the Labor Party, I suppose all political parties are tribal in some sense, it's some a bit more intensely so than others, and they set their platforms and they seem to, and that can be done for reasons of political accommodation, I guess, as much as anything else. Have you, have you been in the situation where you've had a core belief which has been struggle, at odds with a platform or something like that where you've had it, or a, I suppose decisions in a caucus room or something of that kind? Certainly. Um, I, I don't think you could be in the Labor Party and probably not uh, be in that situation. Um, but I think one of the things is that you join a political party you have to accept that the collective view, the collective wisdom, is what's going to uh, allow that party to achieve its goals and aims. And therefore, that means sometimes you'll be on the winning side. I was in the left of the party, so I was more often on the losing side. Mm. Uh, but I, I had to really accept. I remember someone saying to me very early on, the Labor Party is the party that's most likely to be able to realise the aspirations of working in disadvantaged people. And if that <coughs> means that you have to deal with some policies that you don't like, then that's what uh, is, is needed to take forward the greater good. But yes, yeah, certainly, I mean, electricity privatisation is the classic example of an issue that really, you know, tore our party apart, not just on one occasion, but on many occasions. Yeah. Carmel, I have a question for you. In hindsight, do you wish you had more room to be able to communicate that, yes, why this is the party line, be it on privatisation of electricity, but this is where I sit on it? Because I don't witness a lot of that happening, where people feel the freedom to have their individual opinions expressed. That may be at odds with, this, with the party line. And that's not about yeah, look like, like an assault on the party policy, <coughs> but just communicating a different stance. I understand what you're saying and sometimes there is some room for that, but I guess I'm a bit of a traditionalist on this. You, you know, in a way, it's a luxury that if you're really going to be able to try and realise your political goals, that's a luxury that can really undermine your capacity to realise those political goals. So, you know, it's all very well to be able to be uh, I, I guess, uh, to, to stand back and say, well, I want the benefits of being a part of a broader mm. collective that makes decisions and then has a view that once those decisions are made within the party, you go forward in a unified way and try and prosecute those decisions. But I still want the ability to be able to say, yeah, but I didn't really agree with it and, and, and this was my view and, you know, I, 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 I want the, the kind of best of both worlds. And I, I think there's some how challenges How far does that, that go down? So I can imagine... Sorry? I'm just wondering how far it goes down. So I can imagine you've got a, a whole party which reaches a view and you say, OK, well, I'm bound by that. But then you can be in a faction. You mentioned you're in the left. If you have a view different... Are you bound by your faction's view as well? Or... And then the subgroup within that of which is the thing so that, in a sense, you're... I mean, this guy, imagine that... When I say factions, it's people think about Labor. There are factions in the Liberal Party. We read about them all the time as well, you know, the moderates and the this and the that. Mm -hmm. But how, how, how do you form a view in that kind of place where discipline is so important there? Um, well, you're not bound by your faction or sub-faction position, right. strictly speaking, 
but in reality the way things work that is usually what would happen because you would nut things out within a group and decide on a course of action and take that forward and then try and prosecute that within within the broader party but but obviously the discipline really actually applies to the caucus and and to the cabinet not not to the faction or the or, or the sub faction if you go down to um, if you go down to that level and I think it's just probably uh, a view about how you achieve change. And I accept that it's not an approach for everyone, um, but for me, I could largely see that it was effective and that it worked and that there did have to be some discipline. Now, that is not to say that at times you felt so strongly about an issue that you had to find a way to um, communicate that. So certainly internally within the party, within my party branches, I would be very honest with my branch members and if there was a decision that was taken uh, by the caucus that I didn't agree with, I would communicate that <coughs> to my branch members. But I would not go out usually and publicly say that. I mean, I was a member of cabinet, so it was much more constrained anyway. I've got to, I'll come um, to um, Victor, who's currently a serving minister, and John is a former leader of the party. Before I do, I just should encourage anybody who's watching online, if you've got a question, feel free to put it through. And I do have one that's been directed to you. So I'll, since we're on this, I'll just send it to you. Uh, it says for you, Carmel Tebbett, have you ever had difficulty making the choice to separate your party's policies with your personal beliefs? And how did you choose? How do you choose? Or was it maybe you didn't have that problem? Um, I think that on some of the social issues, for want of a better um, uh, phrase, yes, it was sometimes difficult. Um, particularly, I mean, the Labor Party's changed a lot more recently on some of those issues. But early on, the Labor Party's position on abortion, on women's yeah. right to choose, um, I can remember when I was quite young and first joined the party, I, I, I really did struggle with that. Um, but I guess uh, reconciled myself with the view that we were campaigning within the party to change that. And that was what I saw as being important. And I think we're seeing it now with the debate about energy and climate and things and parties trying to balance these things, you know, lead and take them through. I, I don't think it's... Was, was, it, was it, as a leader, does it give you greater flexibility or is that you're actually more constrained in some ways because you're having to balance competing mm. interests under leadership? Well, part of it, of course, is determined by conditions and issues of the time. When I became leader uh, and soon after that period, the then government brought forward the equalisation of the age of consent mm. legislation after the 2003 legislation uh, election. And I remember saying to our party room, not the joint party room, just the Libs, not the Nats, that um, this will be a conscience vote. I didn't put the conscience vote to a vote, I just said it will be a conscience vote. And I also said very clearly that please feel free to disagree strongly with anybody else in this room, but don't make it personal. And that's very important. I mean, if it gets, I can't believe you, Victor, are thinking this versus I disagree with that view, it, that maintains some party loyalty. Um, when I was first elected, the then government um, pulled on a vote on the extension of the um, supervised injecting room in King's Cross, which I had supported as a shadow minister, along with just two or three others. And I remember having just become leader, sitting with three other Liberals with the entire Labor Party voting against the entire the rest of the Liberal Party and all of the National Party. So against your party and against my entire party except yeah. three others and the entire National Party, our coalition partners. And um, what is interesting is I got no negative media coverage and no mail criticising me for that, the story would have been if I'd flipped. So the consi changed because my you were mind. consistent, you were, Correct. you were fine. Correct. Can I just make one point? Yeah. I don't know why we think it's a bad thing that sometimes you have to compromise your views. I mean, we're in a society where many of us think polarisation is the problem we're facing. So, you know, when I went into Parliament, I fully assumed I'd agree with 70, 80 or 90 per cent, but never 100 per cent of what mm. my party agreed with, but I'd much prefer to be 70, 80 or 90% ahead than saying, you know, I'm 10% uh, 
a failure. So w w this, this terrible polarisation, which we're, we see a lot of, I think, in commentary in Australia. I don't know whether we see it come voting day, to be honest. Yeah. I'll, um, I'll come to the, the commentary in a moment. You've almost spookily summoned up another question. Right. The, uh, which I'll put to you. And in a representative democracy, shouldn't our elected representatives' primary responsibility be to their constituents rather than to a political party? Well, we have the function for that, which is private members' legislation and private members' statements, which happen in this chamber. I don't know, Victor, they still every, yeah, yeah. every Thursday. Um, so there is still that capacity. Interestingly, in my but, but they don't have a great time of it, do they? I mean, uh, no. well, I I would say that in just under a decade in Parliament, I'm not sure I was forced to vote against the interests of my electorate ever. I I, I don't know what your view is, but, no, but do you think you ever? Do you think you would have? Well, bearing in mind voting, voting usually is something. Rarely it's specific. Most mostly it's statewide. It's a po broad policy. Where your electorate's really in need you is on funding. <laughs> right. You know, I need this school, I need that refurbishment by a hospital. None of that stuff comes here, except through a budget, which right. is yeah. very heavily um, covered by the protocols of... Are you sure Parliament. you're not dodging the responsibility there, John, by saying that the votes don't affect your electorate? So if you're privatising electricity, say, and you have a view one way or another, and you're forced to vote against it, that's going to impact your electorate. Or if you're agreeing to, you know, a it's fundamental It's exception, change, not the rule. If you're agreeing to a, a change in the way you know, um, hospitals are deliver delivering their service. That's going to affect your electorate. But, but so no, the question was opposed to the views of your electorate. But it's not like your electorate has a consistent viewpoint in some way. You will have people coming into your electorate yeah, office yeah. with widely varying views. Exactly. And my Even if they voted for you. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah. right. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel <laughs> that if you put your forward, yourself forward as a representative of a particular party and they elect you on that basis, then... That's yeah. what they're electing. Oh. They're electing a Labor representative or a Green representative. Well, there's an interesting thing in this question. I'll get you to comment on it, Victor. Mm. It does refer to representative democracy, which is a very particular mm. kind, which says those people elected to Parliament are not the delegates of their constituents no. to carry their view, but instead an individual <coughs> to bring good judgment to bear on behalf of the electorate. Mm. But it still, I think, raises that question. If the electorate, in your best judgment, would be have served by decision A, and your party is wanting you to make decision B, this is a question of compromise. They get a chance to toss you every four years. They do, but you, you were jumping in there. And I think maybe it's even... I mean, Carmel's referred to this as having been a minister. You are a minister. So there's another layer of discipline, I suppose, around the Cabinet solidarity that bears upon this. Yeah, and, and the reality is people know uh, that you're part of a party mechanism. People know that you may have your individual views. Those views have to be agitated and argued in that cabinet process but it's like the catholic church once the white smoke comes out you know you're locked into a position uh, and and that's if you don't like that then vote for an independent that doesn't have that uh, the same machinery around that person um, but i agree that that people elect somebody to broadly represent them because the world is not static it's dynamic and increasingly so and if we have very static views to the world and, and we're not flexible, mm. then we're just going to cause a lot of pain. OK, now, John used... I think he almost used the gotcha word or the flip, the flip word. He yeah. said if he had voted differently to his own core beliefs around that vote about equalising the age of consent, then the headline would have been Brogdon flips. Mm. I just want to start looking at this because, I mean, a lot of times... I mean, just as an observer of yeah. the political process from a distance. It does seem that whenever politicians change their mind, mm. there is this kind of gotcha moment, ah, oh, backflip, you know, or something like that. When in a, in a sense, you'd probably say, well, I mean, scientists, we love it when they change their yeah. mind based on the evidence. Wouldn't we want our politicians mm. on the face of new evidence to change their mind? So I'm going to ask Antoinette, if maybe you first of all, Victor, as the potential recipient of this. And Antoinette is a journo who might, I don't know. I'm part of the lamestream media, apparently, <laughs> so I'm well equipped to answer this. No, but, but do, is, it a, is it a factor when you're sitting there trying to think, oh, gosh, if we change our mind there, we're going to get, you know, castigated in the Yeah, place. the proverbial backflip. I think mm. pre-COVID, uh, definitely, that had more currency. I think post-COVID, mm. uh, there is a different um, order of things in that, in that, 
people understand that the world is changing so rapidly. But we've also seen political parties deviate from policies they traditionally yeah, hold. Correct. And, but you need to, yeah. because if you don't, uh, then you're going to be left behind or you're going to be uh, putting the population to significant risk. So I, I think hopefully that narrative has changed where you know, it is provided you can, un, you can explain to the electorate why you changed mm. and what's the evidence. It's not just a flippant whim. It is this is the new evidence that's come our way and this is why we need to be agile and change accordingly. Mm. I, I think that is a strength. And is it, is, it, is it a conscious matter that is discussed when thinking about policy that oh, uh, if we if we if we do does somebody I mean like, you've all got media officers and people do they raise the flag and say oh we better be careful about this or? Yeah, definitely oh look that backflip word comes all the time triple somersault double pike whatever it is <laughs> you know, but but the reality is if you've got a change of evidence a change of the factual mm. strata that that you rely upon then that automatically requires you to revisit your decision and therefore maybe change your decision. Have you seen, David, this at work or do you think the reluctance to change because of fear of the opposition, let alone the media, so, you know, yeah. it's, I've, I've got you now. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, as a Greens MP, quite often we might be agitating against the government decision and we're desperately keen to see a backflip. And then um, it's kind of... Do you congratulate of, it publicly when you... Well, it's, it's yeah, interesting. Kind of it is actually interesting how you actually message, if you get a win on something, mm -hmm. um, how you message that. So... An example would be we fought for ages to keep the powerhouse where the powerhouse is um, and, and not see it sort of converted into I don't know, a block of flats or whatever the proposal was to, to do where the powerhouse is. And we eventually got that decision. And so um, went and I still remember going out with the community there. We're out the front of the powerhouse celebrating it and then the um, uh, working out how the messaging. Because actually what you do want to do is you want to celebrate good decisions. Um, even though this person you might have been having a, like a 12-month, you know, uh, no old bars political battle with, you finally, you know, pressured them through a community campaign to change their mind, you actually do want to give credit for the changing of the mind. Did you? Or did you go backflip? Well, um, no. I, well, we didn't use backflip. We just oh. welcomed the decision. I, but, but the media reporting, I think that's where you got your backflip with the triple pike on. That was some of the media, the media want to reporting. You want to box you. It's yeah. a lame okay, well, we'll, come, we'll come to our internet in a moment. Um, just to I'm not saying I'm... Of that. I, I don't, but, but the temptation is, in that moment, and I don't think I'm some sort of perfect angel in this space, but the temptation in that moment is that, you know actually say, well, actually, you know, we had to force you. Yeah, You're right. a terrible person. You've always terrible. You're still terrible. You've only done this because of X. Yeah, to um, make the political capital To make the political it. capital out of it. And, you know, and um, that's where politics drives you. Mm. Um, but, I, but I do think when the community, when they see a decision reverse that they've been, they've been campaigning on, they welcome it. Yeah, I agree. And they actually... Yeah. We should have more politics welcoming oh, those agree. changes when, when facts change. OK, Antoinette, so there's been a bit of a okay. gun loaded for the media yes. and its role in this. There's so much to unpack here. I think uh, the first thing is we know that it's well documented there's a trust deficit both um, in politics and in the media. And so when a politician changes their mind, I think the initial reaction is to be a little bit distrustful or sceptical of it. Then the reaction, the triple somersault, whatever it is, I wish I was that flexible and could do half of those manoeuvres. Um, and it's, it's frustrating when it's so predictable and so partisan dependent on publication. So if The Guardian, for example, goes really hard on a suppo you know, supposed backflip because it's a coalition or a nationals member, and then similarly if News Corp makes it front page because it's a Labor prime minister. And so I think that really populist and predictable response makes people... Not a, con contributes to that trust deficit in both media and, um, and politicians. So I think there needs to be a context given clearly as to why the change was, and then a, by the politician and a response by journalists to give that context and not just outrage on Twitter, because Twitter is where nuance and decency goes to die, um, and people are too quick to go too, too quickly to respond without understanding the full facts. Also, when there are changes of minds from a, from a political perspective on policy, some of the big or high profile cases we've seen, like recently in the past couple of days with Barnaby Joyce um, saying that if those Tamil girls were called Sally and Jane, they would be treated differently. 
um, he doesn't have as much proximity to power because when he was Deputy Prime Minister, he had a very different and hard line, a much harder line approach. Maybe that's because he was having to compromise with others. Again, and similarly with Malcolm Turnbull. Yeah. And so it's kind of frustrating when you see mm -hmm. changes of minds from people who didn't use those, those, those views um, when they had power. And so again, that contributes to the scepticism about why are you changing your mind? Is it because you can't really do anything about your new policy? Um, so there's a dual responsibility. It's, it's, it's not all on us. Isn't some of the scepticism is that nobody knows how these decisions are made in political parties. Hmm. Nobody knows, and because we don't tend to, that, that that's not covered in the media, but nobody knows the basis upon which, say, the Liberal Party party room might change its mind on something. You know, on what basis do Greens MPs make their decisions? Yeah. I mean, as it turns out, we're actually bound to vote in Parliament on the basis of the policies that have been developed by our grassroots members. We have to back them in in Parliament. We, we don't have a conscience vote. We have to back them in. Or resign, is it, if it's some fundamentally opposed to your views? Well, that's ultimately the choice you have, yeah. But, I mean, that being said, you know, policies are very general and you, you debate how they get applied. But the... Um, um, uh, but... You know, but, but nobody knows how the Labor Party makes its decisions behind the scenes. Nobody knows. Well, I think how. they know the process, but they don't know what individuals have necessarily argued within that process. So we don't know what Barnaby Joyce argued internally. Well, I actually, I think there's something more to what David's saying. Yeah. I've just been reflecting on Antoinette's comment. I suspect that the lack of trust... It's we part, don't, we don't not, not understanding because, the process. Because yeah. even if there were good reasons, it's pretty rare that the reasons are actually given. Mm. Mm -hmm. So the public, mm -hmm. I think, tends to think that politicians and parties change their minds on what's popular. Correct. Rather or bowing than what, to big about, business. Yeah, like bowing to big business or yeah. some interest has got hold or, or whatever. And I think you're right on to something about this, that it's the lack of clarity about what's going on and then subsequently, if you like, the authenticity of the reasons mm -hmm. themselves for change, which is part of the issue. And I just don't know how you... Because it must be terrible if you actually make a really good decision and then feel people fi finding that they've got the worst possible motivation being ascribed to those who made that decision. I, I don't know whether I have such an informed view, having been a member of parliament, that my view is out of touch. But I don't know what Carmel's view is. But when you leave, um, other than the fact I've never met anybody who didn't vote for me. Have you ever met anybody? <laughs> when you meet, I voted for you. Um, People who weren't in your electorate. Every, every, everywhere, everywhere, Simon. <laughs> Other than that, um, you know, I don't... Well, you guys are in it. You're, you're a minister. You're in a, 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 a very growing political movement. You're a journalist. When you get out, you do shrug your shoulders a hell of a lot more about, about the way things are done. Now, maybe we know how it's done, yeah. so we sort of think, oh, that's happening because he said that or she's probably it's wrong. That. You're probably just guessing. Well, it's an informed guess. Yeah, or, or alternatively, actually, you know what? People don't give as much interest, they don't have as much interest in politics as you think they do. And because you, you, you are so close to it, it is such an intense life, there's nothing normal about being a politician, which is bizarre because we all want normal people to be politicians. There's nothing normal about it. And you see people come into this joint normal and leave this joint um, <laughs> having been completely institutionalised by true. the way it works. How long does it take to recover? Um, well, Still 16 recovering. years and going. Still recovering. 16 years <laughs> and going. Hoping, <laughs> hoping for a full recovery. But it, people, people are busy. You know, I, went, yeah. I came in here as a married... Uh, man with no children. We now have three children. Mm. Life is so different. You know, the things that matter are so different. And I sometimes think in this world, and even in your world, where you know you need to focus on this stuff, it is mm. not what keeps people awake at night. So, so therefore, the views they often form are from fairly fleeting representations, exactly. whether it be Twitter, media, I, I, newspaper. I actually think the or three noisy constituents. Yeah. I actually think the public is more interested and more open to good argument than we often allow for. If they if they bother to be interested. Yeah. Well, I think the last 12 months has been a really interesting exercise where people weren't searching for answers. They weren't satisfied with what the media were telling them. They weren't satisfied necessarily that the politicians were telling them the truth, be it about vaccination. That's a minority. That's a tiny minority. I don't know. No, but there's, there's plenty of evidence to show that we're more polarised um, and that there are more people, like even the growth of the far right and the neo-Nazi white supremacists, like there, there, there is a growth in that. There are more people yeah. looking for a way forward or a truth mm. or, or their truth. They're looking for and something to make sense of the world. And it comes from a distrust from the way politics is operated. Yeah. And I do think it's... 
you know, I'll go back to that point that I said earlier. I, I think people are deeply suspicious about on what basis policy decisions are made. And there's, there is very little transparency on what basis policy decisions are made. There's a paradox. And it's all, this. this is like the chamber we're in, the chamber I'm in, tends to be a kind of theatre where the script has been written, all the decisions have been made, and then the theatre plays out here for the, for the, the you know... The very average group of actors. We're, we're with a pretty, yeah... It's, it's, <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, very this, average group of actors. This is not the globe. It's not the globe. I can say that. But um, David, I think there's a there's a paradox in this, in, and it's to do with trust and transparency around that. A lot of people invest quite heavily in transparency as a solution, but in fact, transparency makes trust redundant. The point about trust is it's something you accord to a person and the decisions they make when you cannot see them, when they're not being observed. And I'm just mm. wondering. I mean, I've got a couple of questions on the screen which I want to come to, but just to, I'll park that for a moment. What do we do about a political process and the life of a politician in this that engenders trust without necessarily having to have radical transparency? Because you, I, I'm sure you're right in your central thesis. The question is what to do about it. But let me just ask about this. Carmel, yeah. how do you manage and be aware of your own biases? OK, and this is for anybody can answer this, actually. Where you've got your own biases, what forms of information do you use to balance your perspective given that we're all prone to bias? So I, I don't know, anybody I want, want to, to answer in? this one? Yeah. Um, sorry, Carmel, no, I just no. I'm <laughs> passionate about this. This is a lot of the work I do is in diversity advocacy. So yeah. I, uh, Media Diversity Australia advocates for more cultural linguistic diversity in newsmakers, in journalists. So I, my parents, interestingly, to my first point, my parents came as refugees, which is why my views on refugee policy shifting is. Um, particularly personal. Um, we don't have enough Indigenous people, people of colour working in the media. And so I think we all have a bias. We all bring a bias. I come from, you know, my, my parents are refugees. I grew up in Western Sydney. I went to a public school. I was very working class. All of my lived experiences contributes to my worldview and my bias. So the best way to counter bias is to have enough are you people... Very, just the first question, are you very conscious of it then? I am very conscious okay. of it. But I'm also proud of it because I know in my craft it makes me unique and different. Um, and I speak another language, all of those things. I think the best, the best way to, for us to challenge our own biases, but to ensure that our team do, is to bring all the different players in the room. And so we need a political party. We need political representation that is far more representative than it currently is. We're way behind, uh, for example, Canada and the UK. Similarly, we need media um, that is representative. Because when you sit in a room... Do you say the media is further behind... Well, politics in diversity. Um, I've actually looked at that in my book. I keep flogging my book. It's not out yet. Um, out next yeah, fantastic February. Book. There'll be people <laughs> all over Australia waiting for it to come out. <laughs> um, and I look at it um, <laughs> on par, if not worse. So I've got the figures on federal politics um, in, the two in 2019 compared to Canada and the UK. And again, it depends which party and also in the, in the media, it depends which, it depends which outlet. But abysmally behind other Western democracies similar to, our, to ours. No, I... I you're in the chamber where people don't answer questions, so well done. <laughs> My question is, do you think the media is further behind in diversity than politics? Yeah. I think politics? it's comparable. I think it's, it's comparable. But again, it depends which party. So some parties are worse and some media outlets are worse. So, for example, SBS and ABC are doing OK. So it depends on the parties. But you will have to buy my book, John, to get yeah. all of the information. Shameless. Can <laughs> you answer your yes. question? Yes. John? One of the ways I found to manage the bias is to stay in touch with the people you knew before you went into parliament yeah yep. i can't uh, that that sounds stunningly simple but it is so know. true it depends wouldn't what's the, there's a risk wouldn't they that they would reinforce your existing biases if oh, usually were... not they're very good at bringing you down to earth um no, but... But, but it is true i mean you because this place cha i mean I, yeah. i'm saying it again this place changes you this place cha let me use this example Sorry, do, you, do, you, do you all all four of you who've been in this place do you all agree you've changed I... in the way that john's describing they're institutionalised. The I'm not moment. talking about They you. won't realise it till they leave. They don't, and, they, and they don't have a book coming out. <laughs> can, I, can I give you an right, example? You go, you stuck in it. Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. Yeah. I'm a CEO. I'm a chairman. Nobody. I don't walk in the office in the morning and people say, "Good morning, CEO." Good morning, Minister. Good morning, John. <laughs> <laughs> my point is that where else does that happen in the real world? Anyway? They do that? You know, except judges and things oh, like that. People use a lot of uh, descriptors for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, I mean, he's only saying one. As as long call, as it's, we're not as doing long text as it's not messages here, Victor. Oh, but my my point is that the whole you nature of the place... Oh, it depends. If it's, a, if it's in the public sector, yes, because right. it's no different to... And that's my point. That's the work relationship. But then... It's our work relationship. 
No, so, I mean, in my, because I'm a member of the upper house, I get given this title, the honourable, you know, the honourable blah, and my party rejects it because we don't you like it. You don't that. use it in your bio. Yeah, we, we, we reject it. Yeah. We, we say we'd, we're not much interested in those honorifics. We kind of like to mm. make a, take a lot of that status out of politics and make it much more grassroots. But um, so I will, I will often talk to with my staff, and I think if you want to have a good place to be grounded, staff who actually hold you to account and tell you the truth to your face is a pretty good space. Mm. And, and friends from before you went into politics who still don't see you as an MP, they are another good grounding. Right. Um, but, I, I, you know, I think, I, I think having those sort of areas that hold you to account and ground you is really, really important. So I think staff who are willing to tell you the truth to your face and having a kind of relationship like that. But I, I think the idea that ministers get called minister by everybody is... Yeah, but David, like, let's think about, it. Think about it. We stratify a whole lot of other things in society. Um, when we were practising, would you go up to a judge and say, hey, Peter, how are you going? Yeah, that's the you easy have one. These orders. Tell me something. Nobody even calls you CEO. Or... Even with doctors, you know, you refer to... It's because you need... Um, even though they are not worthy sometimes of respect, the office or the position is a respected position and you need to, to, to enshrine that. So I, I understand where you're coming from, but... Uh, there's good um, reason why you would have lines in the army. If, if, if you went up to the general and said, "Hey, Peter, let's just let's go," you you do need those structures in society. Otherwise, it's very hard to. to Maybe an element. It's interesting. Attachment. You know, I'm I'm not sure whether I agree with the minister address <laughs> or not, but you can call me Victor. Deputy Prime Minister. I certainly Deputy recall Victor. that. You can call then me the Honourable. I no. was a minister. <laughs> I remember saying to one quite senior public servant who I had to deal with a lot. And most of your senior public servants, I would find, would not call you minister when yeah, you're in no. a meeting with yes. them. But this particular public servant always would. And I took her aside one day and said, look, really, you know, I'd much prefer you didn't do that. And she said, you don't understand. This is the only way I can operate in yeah, this environment. Yeah, exactly. It makes me comfortable. I'd prefer to keep it doing it. And provides I said, that, that degree of detachment. Exactly. But it doesn't happen. But in, I do it doesn't happen in business. No, no, no. I but you do, you, you know, the bias question. We're, we're almost, I haven't answered the bias question. Oh, yes, the bias question. Yes, and then I've got to get three more out. Yes, I should quickly. answer the bias question because I think it was directed to me. So, <laughs> Sorry. I, don't have I didn't mean to, actually. It was just... It was <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything particularly different to add. I do think that, of course, we all have our own biases and exposing yourself to as broad a circle of people as you can Agreed. to discuss, mm. test your ideas, to take in other viewpoints is, is quite important. I was sharing with uh, David before we started <laughs> that uh, my father is not a uh, Labor supporter. He is a very staunch DLP or Democratic Labor Party or grouper uh, for... for uh, those who identify with that term. And so I felt really my whole political life, I had to sort of justify my views to him because his oh, views wow. were so different. Yeah. And I think in a way that did help me be aware of my own biases and the things that I was perhaps absorbing uncritically from my party colleagues and the company I was keeping because I was sort of testing it against him. Must, I found that quite useful. It's been fascinating sitting around your family at the end of the table. Mm. Yeah. Not only were you Labor, but you were left... Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, Had that's to be a little careful. My grandmother told me joining the Liberal Party was a passing phase I'd go through. And, <laughs> and Auntie Kate cried when I told her I joined the Liberal Party. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I've got three questions. One of them's sort of been answered, but the other two are really good ones. I'm just going, we've only got less than 10 minutes, just so I get some final comments. You can pick and choose from these as you want to. The one that's sort of been answered is, what teams or resources do you leverage when making or changing a decision? And that seems a bit about technical things, but it's also interestingly about this broader networks. What, in your experience, has been the most effective approach to change someone's mind? Um, and then the final one, if politicians were able to admit they don't have the answers or are not fully informed, in other words, mm. say, I do not know, could that prevent the need to change your mind in some senses, in the sense that you're still finding out? Or, you know, particularly if you're a minister... You fixed your mind, so you don't have to yeah, change it. Yeah. Like, a, as a minister, are you required always to have an answer? And do we expect too much from politicians on this basis is the thing there. So, Can I answer the last question first? Yeah, go for it. So I, I posted something on LinkedIn this morning uh, precisely on that last point. I don't know what the future of government looks like. I don't know what the future of democracy looks like. I've got some preliminary thoughts, but I'd love to know what other experts are telling me in terms of 
AI, uh, quantum, uh, nanobots, a whole lot of things. So I'm actually going out there to the world and saying, please educate me because this is something we need to do together. I, I don't have all the answers. In fact, there's a lot of stuff I just don't know. Do you think that's empowering for you as a minister to be in a state of curiosity rather than certainty? Absolutely. Like, like you tell me somebody that knows everything and I'll, tell you, I'll show you the person that knows pretty much nothing. Maybe some of... Well, I think there are a people in <laughs> politics so who claim to know everything. Let me give you the other side of... We've only got five minutes to go. So the other side of Victor's coin, a chance. which is if you don't have a view on something in politics instantly these days... Yep you are dead in the water. Mm -hmm. You've got to oppose it or support it or... So, the, 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 you know, when did you last hear a political leader or a politician come out and say, can I have a few weeks to think about that? But what we do here, which I find evasive from a like, from journalist's perspective, is I'm not across all of the details and um, I'm not sure of that. Or I've just heard top-line information. Usually it's regarding something controversial. And so the I don't know can sometimes be a tool to be evasive. OK, but putting that aside... Yeah. We don't allow people, we don't allow you guys... No, I'm still say, reading say, all the data and... Oh, can you give me a few weeks? I'm yeah. just forming my view. Yeah, and I think that's, that's a... Versus, oh, no, I, think, I, think that's a I think that's a flaw because yeah. sometimes, as I said, the world is so dynamic. Mm. To pin somebody down on a specific issue right now, you do not give them the flexibility to, to alter course. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a bad a thing. good policy does... If you really want to change yeah. something and do good policy reform, it takes... Minimum months, normally Correct. years. Good. I remember working with Victor on, CTP. on oh, yeah, on the green slips and yeah. uh, the insurance products. And most of the time, we worked cooperatively, but we really couldn't talk about that publicly because it wasn't going to do him any good. It wasn't going to do me any good. Yeah. Um, but we kind of got a good outcome, I think. And I think that's something people don't see. I take it that's not an unusual thing. There must be quite a bit that happens behind the scenes where you work cooperatively. And maybe your views do change. You know, they're leavened a bit by somebody in the Labor Party. So the interesting idea. question is, the government doesn't control the upper house, so they have to negotiate. It would be interesting to see if you negotiated when you didn't need that, to. That, that's a really good question, yeah. John. That's a really good question. But I, I remember uh, t uh, having two rounds around the domain with David, saying, we can't get through the upper house. So, you know, we've got to work with you. And David a moment of credit. desperation for Victor had to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> David's, David's a decent bloke, but um, <laughs> it actually produced good reform. Final comment good from reform. you, Antoinette. What was the first question? I know we answered the second. What, which teams and resources do you leverage when making or changing a decision? The other one was, what in your experience has been the most effective approach to change someone's mind? Yeah, this is interesting because this is what I effectively try and do. Facts alone and proof do not yeah. change people's mind. You can whack them over. I call it fact whacking people over the head and it just doesn't work. We know that with climate change. We know that even with the diversity movement. We know that having more thinkers at a table, be it in a democracy, in parliament or in media, in business, it, you're, you're more likely to be lucrative, uh, spot spontaneous, innovative, staff stay longer. Despite all of the evidence, people will not have their minds changed. People connect to stories. They connect to humour. They connect to humans. They don't care about big philosophical ideals and the right thing because science or data shows it. So it takes patience, it takes humour, it takes time. That's what I think. I mean, just a few things. It just takes a few things and a lot of patience. Final comment from each of you. John, on any of the things we've touched on, a final comment? Uh, teams and resources is interesting, um, and I'll go back to what I agree with David. You need to be challenged by the people around you. Tamil, final thoughts? Um, I certainly think there needs to be more space for politicians to take time to make decisions and to be able to change their mind. But I think there's a limit to that because at the end of the day, you are elected yeah. to lead and to make decisions and you have imperfect information and you have to make hard calls. And sometimes that's just the nature of the job and you have to work with that. So should you I, be given greater allowance if you get it wrong in those circumstances? Well, I think mm. what would be good is to have the space to be uh, more authentic and provide more information about why you might need to change your mind because often that space is not allowed when that mm. when that has to happen but you know if you're changing your mind every and there are politicians who did that mm -hmm. and the electorate will not um look kindly on that neither i remember somebody saying of a former premier in this place that he blew he bent before the wind blew yeah, or you know <laughs> he's like a cushion that's David? the impression of the last person who sat on <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> That's very good. Final comment. That's awkward image. Um, <laughs> the, um, um, well, I'd agree with Antoinette. Look, I, I came into politics thinking, oh, it must be about people not knowing the facts. Yeah. <laughs> it must be about, you know, you haven't persuaded them with the right amount of evidence. And it would be about gathering the evidence and showing it to people. And then, of course, you know. They're too busy. They're too um, busy. Well, well, I don't think politics is great on doing evidence-based decision making. I think that's mm. a, a major failure in politics. Uh, but it's also acknowledging that actually that's not how you persuade the public. Um, I think if you want to be good at politics, you need to have the facts and science and evidence on your side. I fundamentally believe that. But then you need to find a way of persuading through stories about people, changing hearts and minds and connecting them to the facts and the science. That's the really hard challenge for politics at the moment, bridging that gap. Because you can scare people, you can inspire people, but connecting it back to science and evidence, that's the challenge. Any last, anything further? I think people are worth. Uh, inherently selfish and it's hard to get them to consider things that doesn't, don't affect their hip pocket or if they're more privileged than somebody else because of their socioeconomic class or the colour of their skin or their gender. It's really hard to get people mm. to, to care about things that don't directly impact them. That's the challenge. I think. A fantastic comment because I'd love to unpack that one. That's <laughs> a whole new conversation. <laughs> last things from you. In a constantly changing world, we need more open minds. Look, um, I'd just like to, firstly, can you, those of you who are in the room, join me for a second. <laughs> the standout for me, I think, is that comment that emerged from the conversation between Antoinette and David about how our lack of understanding of what's actually taking place within the political process invites a public to reach the worst conclusions about how decisions are being made. And that in itself feeds a cycle where it's the gotcha moment, the political opportunity, the so-called backflip with all the other bits that Victor described. I reckon that's something for those who work in this place, if they can take a step back, as John suggested, they might, and Carmel acknowledged, and not become so captured by the machine to think about what could be done to address that, that, that would be a wonderful thing. So, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end uh, of this session from the bear pit. This is the softer side of the place with <laughs> the BEAR pit. Um, on the notion of changing your mind, would you please join with me in thanking everybody for this session?